Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Bellows with Stony Creek Colors. Stony Creek sells clean and safe plant-based dyes, offering traceable and transparent natural dyes for artisan and industrial dyers. Today's video, we are sharing how to make an indigo vat using a chemical reduction method uh, with a reducing agent of hydro or sodium dithionate and soda ash. The benefit of the hydro vat or a chemically reduced vat is that it's very fast to go into reduction and it can dye a wide range of fibers from cellulosics to protein fibers like wool and silk. Uh, so if you want an all-purpose vat and you're in a rush, it's a great option for you. The vat that we're making today, we're calling a hydro vat, but if you are going to use thiourea dioxide instead of sodium dithionate, that uh, you can follow pretty much a very similar protocol. Um, since this is a chemically reduced vat, it's really important to be working in a very well ventilated environment. We're lucky to be outside, um, but if you are working inside, make sure that you have a lot of airflow and um, we're going to be using a dust mask for measuring our ingredients, but you might even want to consider a respirator that will keep out more of the sulfates and breakdown products of the chemical reduction that's going to take place. We will be working today with Stony Creek Colors Natural Indigo Powder, 25%, uh, and we have soda ash for actually making the alkaline environment necessary for keeping the indigo uh, in reduction. And then for our reducing agent, today we're gonna be using uh, this RIT color remover. We actually chose the RIT color remover for our recipes and for these tutorials because um, the packages come hermetically sealed and so um, sodium dithionate especially is very sensitive to um, getting uh, broken down when it's exposed to the air. So this RIT is good because you don't wanna really buy like a whole pound of sodium dithionate somewhere and then um, have it go bad or like change how quickly it reduces and how active the product is. So uh, we kind of like that these are in really bite-sized kind of individual use containers. But um, if you don't like the chemical nature of using sodium dithionate, we have three other indigo dye videos. I will say a couple more things about the hydro vat or these chemically reduced vats, um, at least in my experience. It is a great way to get kind of quick dyeing or introduce people to dyeing um, with indigo. But if you are looking for super dark blues, um, it can be more challenging because the reduction environment um, later on, it, as you're trying to build up successive dips to get to super dark, dark blues, um, it can be a little bit harder to keep that happy medium between um, a reduced indigo environment, but not overly stripping the color um, off of the off of the yardage or the yarns that you're putting in there themselves. So the hydro vat is good um, sort of as a beginner vat, um, but obviously explore all of the different options for indigo dyeing. Um, one really important note just to mention is around um, what you wanna use for your personal protective equipment. So we're gonna be using goggles today, uh, certainly this dust mask. Um, if you're working inside, you might even consider something that has more um, Respir uh, respirator and then gloves. These gloves, you want to just make sure they're long enough to get inside your vet. So we'll be dying in a five gallon bucket and um, using hot water. But if you are super sensitive to temperatures, you might even consider some heat resistant gloves um, instead of this kind. You'll need a scale and we include in our uh, Stony Creek Colors Natural Indigo Dye Kit a thing of pH strips that can help you just make sure that if your vat goes out of balance, you know what the pH is because that's a great um, starting point for making sure your dyeing is in a pH range that's gonna work for indigo. So let's get started. Uh, I've already measured out the ingredients. We have here 45 grams of the Stony Creek Colors 25% pure natural indigo powder. If you're using uh, one of our higher purity powders, then you'll be able to use a little bit less space on the formula that we provide to you. So I have my indigo powder. This is uh, natural indigo grown in Tennessee uh, with our contract farmers. We have some soda ash. Um, the soda ash or the sodium carbonate is uh, for increasing the pH of the vat. What's interesting about the Rick color remover is actually a includes some sodium carbonate in there. So you have a little bit of the alkaline uh, environment created just from the RIT color remover itself. So here we have uh, 
one, about three quarters of the box of the writ is already in here. It's just like about 45 or 50 grams of it. And um, we have 10 grams of soda ash. If you're going to be dyeing wool or silk, you can actually use less soda ash. Um, you'll want to get your pH to like no more than nine really, eight or nine for wool dyeing. It's just right at the cusp of indigo being able to go into reduction, but not so alkaline that it's gonna be really bad for um, too abrasive on the wool itself. For cotton, you uh, have a much more resilient fiber, and so you can um, make your dye vat at like pH 10, which is going to uh, be the best really for the indigo. So we already measured out the indigo, uh, and so we're gonna wet it out. So this is the process really of making sure, uh, while we're still able to stir up the indigo, that we um, get it all into, uh, into the water. So later on when we make the vat, we're gonna wanna really minimize the amount of stirring that we're doing. And so here is a chance to make sure your indigo goes well into solution. I um, have already heated up this water, so I can just pour it on and then make sure that um, I don't add too much water because I honestly want to get all of my ingredients and the water into this one jar. So I'm just stirring and um, if you buy, for example, the um, natural indigo paste, you can skip this step because the indigo is already pre-wetted out. So we'll just be stirring to make sure that there's no kind of powder around. Make sure that's all well incorporated. If you wanna tumble it around with any marbles, you can do that as well. This went in really nicely, so I think we can skip that step. Here we have our soda ash. Um, for the most part, I'm just keeping my mask off so that you can hear me. I would recommend when you're handling any powders, you want to definitely uh, keep that dust mask on. Um, what we can do next is actually make sure that our indigo is really um, well dissolved and we're gonna be adding the um, sodium dithionate or the hydro, in this case using the RIT color remover, actually just on the top of the um, top of the bath so we don't have to handle it multiple times. So I'm gonna pour in my um, soda ash here as there are lots of ways of doing indigo dyeing, um, there are also different chemicals that you can use for the process. Whether you are um, making your own lye, for example, from wood ash, or you're using washing soda or soda ash, um, the purpose is the same. It's really to bring up the pH uh, to make a more alkaline environment. Before I add in the um, color remover or the sodium hydrosulfite with sodium carbonate in there, I'm just going to give this a little bit more water and then put this mask on because I'm going to be handling the powder. I'm just stirring ever so gently. I'm actually not raising the spoon out at all. I just want to make sure my ingredients are well incorporated and I want to really, really minimize um, the amount of oxygen that I'm going to get into this fat. Our hydro vat stock solution is going into reduction. This is going to take place really quickly compared to some of the other vats. And so you see that we're already having a really bright yellow um, solution. This is a really, really strong stock solution. Ideally, you would have a mason jar like double the size um, or split your stock into two. We are going to let this reduce a little bit longer and prepare the actual um, vatting solution. So I have a five gallon bucket here filled with about um, four gallons of water. It's really pretty hot. Um, I just took the temperature and it's about just under 140 degrees, 135. We're doing this dyeing video outside and so we just boiled some water on the stove and brought it out here 
and um, we're at 133 degrees. We um, do know f that a hotter temperature is going to help your reduction, but it's not absolutely necessary to have a hot vat while you're doing hydro dyeing. Um, with indigo, the, um, the vat, if it goes out of reduction though, often you can find that heating up the vat will help it. Um, people do that in a lot of ways. If you are dyeing in a stainless steel pot, you can obviously put it on a hot plate or put it on your stove. Um, make sure if you're doing that, that everything's really well labeled, that you're not gonna accidentally start cooking food in it or no one else in your household will grab it for uh, using for food. Once you have used any of your utensils for dyeing, they should really um, stay in your uh, dyeing equipment and not go back into the general kitchen use. So we're going to add some soda ash to this uh, bucket to bring up the pH a little bit, and then we're gonna add a little bit of the um, remaining uh, amount of the RIT color remover, which has soda ash in it also, as well as the sodium hydrosulfite. So um, I know since I measured out the uh, original stock solution that I can put the rest of this jar in here for the four gallons I'll dye with. And then we're gonna have five grams of the soda ash that I already measured out. So your stock solution will actually be five grams of the soda ash, plus then you'll put another five grams in here. So you can definitely add um, water to the washing soda. You're really at such a low um, amount of soda ash in here that it's gonna really dissolve pretty well. Um, but you can always instead add water to um, the soda ash or the washing soda to get that to go into solution. We're gonna stir that up. And then we'll add our Rick color remover. As I mentioned, um, this particular way of getting hydrosulfite already comes with some sodium carbonate or um, soda ash in it. So um, certainly if you are not using Rick color remover and you're gonna get hydrosulfite, you'll probably want to increase your um, amount of soda ash undoubtedly to bring up the pH. I'll just measure this to give you guys a sense of how much was left in the container, but um, we've got just about 19 grams remaining. And so I'll just really gently stir that in. Sodium hydrosulfite is really reactive and so um, it can be really smelly. You want to make sure, as I said earlier, you're working in a very well ventilated environment and potentially um, wear a mask that is going to protect um, more than just dust. We are going to let this sit maybe like 10 or 15 minutes really just to um, make sure the environment's all ready when it is time to go do our indigo dyeing. I'm already um, somewhere kind of bordering on um, pH 8. So you know that we added a lot of Rick color remover, which has sodium carbonate and then a little bit more soda ash to this um, stock solution. And so we'll continue to raise the pH when we put our stock solution in there. Um, for the cotton, you'll want to be at about a pH of 10 and for wool, ideally be a little bit south of that, like eight or nine, um, something where your indigo is in reduction, but you are um, able to keep your material safe. So our hydro vat stock solution has really taken on like a yellow brown appearance almost. You can see that there is a little bit of the bluish sediment at the bottom. That is, I think really because this is such a strong solution that uh, there wasn't enough really uh, water in here. So what we're gonna do is very slowly um, pour the stock solution into the vat um, that's been prepared so it's slightly alkaline. And I'll show you um, a couple of techniques that we like to employ for um, making sure we're not adding too much oxygen. So um, there's two things 
that we're going to try to do here. One is um, to make sure that we're not putting a lot of air into the vat when we put our stock solution in there. And so one of the ways I like to do that is to gently kind of like almost lower the base of the uh, mason jar in and then I can slowly pour out the solution without a ton of oxygen going in. The coppery sheen, uh, if you waited longer for your vat, you're going to see way more of that. Now I want to um, actually do something a little different this time, which is put water back on here and recap it. The reason I'm going to do this is because I was trying to cram it all in one mason jar for my stock solution. And um, for such a big vat, it's really just not enough. So pouring the water down the side. I'm going to actually just let this sit a little bit longer and see if we can get some of this indigo to go um, all the way into reduction. So because this is such a fast acting vat, um, we're just going to take this chance to, to get a really, really complete reduction. So I had that hot water um, already in the kettle. I'm just really making sure that... Um, Everything along the bottom is going to go up into the liquid section of this vat. And, um, and we're going to let this sit with the lid on it for a little while longer and just kind of see what happens. Because we know that um, we put a ton of powder in there, right? Almost 50 grams of red color remover, sodium carbonate, and our indigo powder. And so um, we really didn't have that much liquid. Now back to the vat. Um, We've now added our stock solution. In most cases, you'll literally have just put your entire stock solution into the vat. And so I'm going to grab a stick and we're going to like um, really just gently stir to make sure no sediment was down at the bottom. But this vat, we don't really want to stir it hardly at all. When we are stirring an indigo vat, we want to just be so careful to not really hardly add any um, oxygen. So I'm not doing like a vigorous stirring here. I'm just making sure that nothing has settled to the bottom of the vat. If you're trying to achieve really dark blues, the way to get there is not by adding more indigo powder or more ingredients to your vat necessarily. You can um, always play with what works best for you and increase um, some of your ingredients a little bit to get to your desired effect. But with all indigo dyeing, the way to um, build up the color is just by successive dips. So you can see that I've kind of, um, hopefully I didn't wreck too much havoc on this vat. I have definitely increased the amount of oxidized indigo at the surface, which you don't want it too much of, but this coppery sheen is really uh, oxidized indigo that is um, layering together right at the surface where it's exposed to oxygen. And so you have pretty uh, typical that right here um, where you can just see at the surface that it's kind of this yellow color. So we had actually added a little bit of water to our um, the stock solution jar that had a little um, stuff down at the bottom. We had probably reached kind of the solubility limit of the amount of uh, with the amount of water that we had in there and so I have added more water and it's now taken on this kind of greenish tint um, to indicate that I have more reduced indigo back in there. And we are now making a super strong hydro vat with what we have. Now I have now just a little bit of sediment left at the bottom. Um, and so I'm not going to dump this whole bunch of sediment in there. I'll just tie it off, top it off with a little bit more water and let this sit you can certainly let this stock solution sit over literally like a day or two um, i would in that scenario definitely put it in a bucket just um, in case but if you made the stock solution one day and then you wanted to do your dyeing the next day or have it ready for dyeing the next morning that's really okay so we've got um, some reduced indigo up at the top kind of indicated by the coppery sheen and we're going to let this sit maybe like another couple of minutes just since I just added that um, the remainder of the stock solution. Our hydro vat made from natural indigo is now in reduction and ready for us to begin dyeing. 
Uh, before we begin, uh, if you are uh, able to peer into this vat and see that there's sort of a coppery sheen at the surface, um, this is actually oxidized indigo. So uh, where the indigo is interacting with the air, it's going to turn blue, which is the oxidized form. Actually below the surface of the vat, it has taken on the characteristic uh, greenish yellow of a reduced vat. So before we begin dyeing, I'm actually going to want to skim this bloom or the oxidized indigo away from the center of the vat where, because um, I don't want the fully oxidized indigo to get onto um, my fabric. Another cool trick is um, to actually use a drop of detergent. This will help the indigo vat, um, or the, the oxidized indigo rather, uh, sort of scatter off the surface. You're just kind of removing some of the surface tension to allow it to get to the edge. So if you do a lot of um, printing, for example, this oxidized indigo is great to save and um, use for printing. If you put it onto a piece of fabric, you can um, later wring this out in your rinse water and put it back in your vat at the end of the day. So um, again, this indigo is not reduced, but it can stain. So just be cautious when you're um, handling it. To actually begin dyeing, just uh, to sort of reiterate the process that we're going through, we're going to want to submerge fully wetted out fabric. So t-shirt that's already been soaked in water. We want to really just put it into the vat and keep it under there. We don't want to keep bringing it in and out of the vat. We want to hold it beneath the surface and work the fabric underneath the surface, spreading it out so that there's no sort of um, air bubbles or um, places where the fabric's really bunched up. So I have my cotton t-shirt here. It's already wetted out and I'm going to use one hand to um, really hold it up and the other to work it down beneath the surface itself. Um, I can see that the vat itself has a really sort of greenish um, yellow color and I want to get it in there quickly so that um, especially with a vat sort of as strong as this uh, hydro vat recipe is, we want to get it all pretty even uh, and under there as quickly as possible. So right now I'm really just working my hands around the fabric, spreading it around under the surface. You know, we really like to recommend your first dip is the longest. Uh, so you can have that be anywhere from one minute to five minutes. Um, and then successive dips you can uh, have just be about 30 seconds. In between each dip, it's important to take a step called oxidation. So when we remove this fabric from the indigo vat, it's actually going to appear like a yellowish green color. That's the leuco indigo that's actually penetrating the fiber. That's what we have in this indigo vat is indigo in the leuco form or the reduced form. So now um, when I pull it out, I want that leuco indigo to convert back into the oxidized indigo or the blue form. So we're going to have this chemical transformation really occur right before our eyes by holding it out and open to the air. And um, through that period of like successive dips, into the vat is how we build up the color. So we don't want to just leave this t-shirt in here for an hour to get a really dark blue, or we don't want to dump more indigo into it to get a dark blue. We want to build up layer upon layer of indigo through multiple dips, um, as many as six or eight dips if you want a really dark blue um, to get that deeper sh those deeper shades. So now um, I'm going to pull the fabric out of the vat, but actually before I do that, I'm going to sort of squeeze it together underneath the surface of the um, vat. So I'm going to keep my hands in the water or in the vat rather and sort of start squeezing out that water now before I pull it out. So this is going to help me because I don't want a bunch of dripping back into the vat once I start pulling the fabric out. So you can see that um, I have a really awesome like almost fluorescent yellow green color here and I have um, a controlled squeezing where I'm not putting tons of drips into the fabric. Now I have my rinse bucket next to me um, but before I just submerge it into the rinse some dyers prefer to just plunge it straight into the rinse water. I actually like to let it sort of aerial, aerial oxidation occur so just right out into the uh, open air and I like to spread the fabric so I can really just see 
A, I like to see that transformation occurring of the leuco indigo to the indigo itself. So we're slowly having a conversion from the um, yellow green of the leuco indigo into the oxidized indigo. So my t-shirt here is really uh, nearly completely oxidized. I'm actually gonna hang it on the line uh, just for a little bit to let it fully oxidize. If you are in a big rush uh, and you need to plunge this in water and keep doing your dyeing, you can also do that. Um, the actually hanging of it is called sky time and this is um, just allowing that full leuco indigo to convert to um, the reduced indigo. I don't want to um, get a line on my fabric um, from this clothesline, so I would never want to like leave it like this overnight or anything like that. Just this is a place to hold on to your fabric while you're dyeing multiple items. You can also submerge this into some water. We'll probably, um, you don't have to do a rinse step for the hydro vat to go back into the indigo vat. Um, if in the case of the iron vat, for example, you do have to rinse in between each step of dyeing. Um, or we find that that's best. With the hydro vat, you can let it hang and drip and then put it back in the vat, but don't let it ever dry on the line. Um, you know, this is still a really alkaline piece of uh, fabric that still has a really high pH. And so you wanna make sure if you're done dyeing for the day, you have to um, rinse this out and do your vinegar soaking. So we'll get a couple more garments dyed um, and then we are going to um, move to the next step, which is building up the color. With protein fibers and especially wool, you need to make sure that the pH of your vat is not too high um, or it can lead to um, really damaging the fiber. So I have here a piece of silk. Um, it's beautiful woven silk. We're going to demonstrate how to put a piece of fabric as opposed to a t-shirt into the vat. In general, I like to really have um, the fabric as opened up as possible. When doing sort of like commercial scale or larger, um, larger size pieces of fabric. Um, my sister and I used to do pieces of fabric up to like 10 or 20 yards. We'd actually need one person on one side of the fabric and another sort of holding it open to dump it, uh, sort of gradually submerge the fabric into the vat. Um, and that worked especially well with fermentation vats at like a 300 gallon scale. But um, in this case, I can hold the fabric in one hand and submerge it with my other hand. And I wanna work it down and then start, just as with the t-shirt, um, submerging it and keeping it below the surface. So sometimes an air pocket might form in the fabric where it's going to cause like a bubble or something. Um, you want to really gently work that out of there so that you can get the most level dying and really try to minimize the number of bubbles that you're sending up to the surface because um, that's really just a sign that you're, um, you're sort of agitating it a bit. So here I am, I've submerged my silk and I'm not gonna hold this one quite um, as long beneath the fabric. Just, you know, if we're targeting sort of a lighter color, you don't need to dip it for as long. Um, if you are trying to get a really deep color, the way to get there best is to really do successive dips. So um, with all indigo dyeing, you wanna do, I would say a minimum of three dips. So even if you're aiming for a very light color, let's say baby blue or something like that, you need to dip it three times uh, to prevent sort of the crocking and to allow the indigo to really stay on that fabric. And so uh, even if your dips only end up being like 20 seconds, um, do three of them as opposed to just one, you know, one minute long dip or something like that. Um, this method of building up the successive uh, layers of indigo is going to be the best to promote sort of uh, the the deeper penetration of the indigo dye into the the yarn and into the fiber itself. So I'm going to slowly um, squeeze this fabric out below the surface. You can see that it has the greenish yellow sort of characteristic leuco appearance to it. And if I weren't squeezing it right below the surface, I could always just take it out and let it drip over something else. Um, the downside of doing that is certainly that you're going to lose a lot of indigo into your rinse bucket. And then um, 
you might be a little uh, bit more wasteful of the indigo unless you were gonna reclaim all your rinse liquid um, and sort of add it to your vat later on um, at the end of the day when you're done dying. So certainly you're removing some water from the vat every time you die and so don't be surprised if the next day um, following a major you know, day of dying you have less liquid in your vat. That kind of makes sense because you're getting some out of there. Um, so with the silk, I'm actually going to rinse in between each dip. Just, um, I haven't let the oxidation kind of fully occur yet. You can see that the color is still shifting. Um, but since I have a pretty high pH vat, I wanna um, just make sure that I'm being as delicate with the silk as I can be. I went straight from the vat, dripping just a little bit into my rinse bucket and rinsing out this piece of silk and um, that's okay to do if you don't want to wait for this to dry on the line or you're worried about the um, sensitivity of your fabric you can go right into the rinse and you see here that we have a really lovely blue color now if you love this color uh, from your first indigo dip uh, you can't stop there because when the fabric is wet, it actually is going to appear a lot darker than it is uh, once it's dry. And since you're probably not gonna be wearing your scarf wet all the time, uh, you wanna actually dip about one or two shades darker than uh, the color appears when it's wet to get that color once the fabric's dried. So we're gonna re-dip this silk fabric um, at least two or three more times in order to get this, uh, the appearance of this dark shade. Uh, and we can just keep building up successive dips uh, until we get to the color that we want. Following the same exact process, um, these later dips can be a little bit um, shorter, certainly, um, if you don't want to build up too much color onto it, but a minimum of three dips um, is absolutely recommended. Now, each time you pull the fabric out, uh, once you've built up that initial blue color, it will certainly appear less and less sort of bright green or bright yellow when you remove it from the base uh, or from the vat itself. The base color of the indigo will start coming through and so you'll kind of move from that really sort of bright fluorescent greenish yellow towards a more teal when you remove it from the vat. Um, and then it, as it oxidizes, it, it will go to a darker and darker blue. If you start removing indigo dyed fabric from the vat after spending 30 seconds or a minute in there and it's just coming out completely blue, you probably have a problem with your vat unless your fabric is just so dark that you can't um, see the dyeing anymore. So here I know that it's still picking up color because it, um, I can see that it's oxidizing and changing. So it's going to still move even though the base color is blue, um, I can really see that it's picking up some of the reduced indigo and getting on the fabric. If you dip a completely white piece of fabric into your vat and it comes out blue right from the beginning, uh, you have an oxidized vat and you need to um, take steps to put the vat back into reduction. So uh, as long as when you're removing the fabric, it's green or yellow, or if you have a very dark blue piece of fabric that went into the vat in the first place, it might be a little bit harder to see, but you'll um, see that the color is getting darker, then you know your vat is in working order. The hydro vat that we just finished dyeing uh, produces a really uh, great range of blues. You can see really that um, we have everything from a dark blue all the way through to light blues. And the important thing to remember, of course, when you're doing indigo dyeing is that uh, the number of dips that you put into the vat will indicate kind of the depth of indigo shade that you're going to get. So in the case of the hydro vat specifically, if I wanted all the shirts to dye to the darker color, I um, would probably try dyeing fewer shirts and give them more dips each. We ended up exhausting the hydro vat uh, that we created um, with about 16 or 20 shirts, but as you see, the color ranges that we got are definitely ranged to being pretty light. Um, we noticed as we were dipping, uh, certainly, that once the vat um, had had a lot of shirts dipped in it um, over a, you know, a two-day period, we had um, 
we were dipping and it, the indigo didn't seem to be getting very much darker. This is because um, while the vat was still under reduction, so we could still see that yellow color, there was really not that much indigo left in the vat. So uh, the things to remember about the hydro vat are that it's a very um, efficient use of indigo, meaning that pretty much all the indigo in the vat is going to be under reduction. So you do, for the most part, have a little um, bit of fewer challenges of making sure your indigo is under reduction. But the trade-off is that you have a chemically reduced vat that um, is a little bit of, um, you have to be a little bit more cautious just in general with using the chemically reduced vats because you have to be working in a well-ventilated environment. You are um, using, especially in the case of the sodium hydrosulfite, um, you have breakdown products that you don't want to inhale too much, so like other chemicals. And uh, certainly, you know, it's not as renewable a dyeing system as something like the fermentation vat or any of the reducing sugars vats. So, um, if you are dying and you have the ultimate emphasis on sustainability, you obviously may want to look into some of the other vats and get very comfortable with them. But if you're new to indigo dyeing uh, and you're sure that you're able to work in a safe environment with it, then it, the hydro vat's a good option for just understanding sort of what is indigo, what successful indigo dyeing look like. Uh, and if you are very um, interested in kind of getting the most uh, sort of conversion of indigo into indigo on your garment or fabric, then that uh, could be a good option for you. So uh, the hydro vat um, or any of the chemically reduced vats are um, going to give you a really wide range of colors, of course, um, and pretty much sort of what we would think of as the really like pure blue of indigo dyeing can be really best achieved either the hydro vat or the fermentation vat, um, the fructose that or the iron vat can give you kind of slightly different tones of your blue which are lovely to work with but also um, if you're looking for that like really crisp bright blue uh, that you might think of for indigo dyeing then probably the fermentation vat or the hydro vat are your best bets. Thanks we hope that you enjoyed uh, this video tutorial on indigo dyeing with the hydro vat. See you next time.